Welcome to worship at Nokomis Heights Lutheran Church on this um, celebration of God's love and God's remembrance of all of us as we worship God together on this 11th of September. My name is Pastor Chris Capel and I'm happy to join you this morning. Um, both of my colleagues are out this week, so I'm happy to be with you in worship. We begin a new series um, and this series is about a God who remembers. We're looking at stories in the Old Testament for the next several weeks, 
stories that we may not have visited, at least not in worship and in a sermon context. We certainly maybe have learned them in Sunday school and at Bible studies and other time in our lives. But we get a chance now to unpack these stories um, through the context of worship. Uh, today, we are talking about Noah and the Ark, which is appropriate because here we are out on Lake Nokomis on this super windy day. I didn't know it was so windy when we decided to record outside, but I think it's a good thing that it's windy because maybe it gives us just another glimpse into the story of Noah and the Ark. A story about God remembering Noah and his family and bringing them to salvation. And we get to dig into this story and learn about how it can be good news for us today. So let's worship together in the name of God who created us, God who redeems us through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit who is with us always. bring to God the whole truth of our messy lives and remember the promises of Christ. God, you speak to us in many and various ways, including creation. Each time you hang a rainbow in the sky, you remind us that you take sin seriously, for you want only love and justice on every square inch of this planet. You want wholeness for each unique person and healing for creation itself. In these last days, you have spoken to us through Jesus, who has taken away the power of sin. Help us to live in your freedom. We read in scripture that the ancestors were as complicated as we are. Abraham was an example of faithfulness, yet sometimes forgot to trust God's promises. His state of forgetting led to suffering. Our state of forgetting causes suffering too. When we forget to trust or trust love over violence, generosity over hoarding, and community over isolation. In these last days, you have spoken to us through Jesus, who understands our messiness and contradictions. Help us to trust Jesus above all else. The stories we believe and pass on often come from voices that distort truth in order to erase the evil of patriarchy, racism, greed, or violence. Give us wisdom to believe and pass on stories from every kind of people, especially from those whose voices are silenced under the knee of oppression. In these last days, you have spoken to us through Jesus, who confronted injustice and was crucified. Help us to hear his prophetic voice. Hear these words. In the name of God, our Creator, Savior, and Spirit, all your sin, all your contradictions, and all your doubts are washed in God's unending grace. You have been freed to start a fresh new story. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
we pray together the prayer of the day. O oh God, because of your great love for us and the world you made, you grieve, you get angry, you show mercy, you rejoice. Even in brokenness, you remain steadfast in your love, and you will never forsake us or turn your back on the world. For that, we offer our unending praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's lesson is the story of Noah from the book of Genesis, chapters 6, 8, and 9. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. These are the descendants of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I am going to destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. It's width 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and put the door of the ark on its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For my part, I'm going to bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing, of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, Two for every kind shall come into you to keep them alive. Also take with you every kind of food that is eaten and stored up, and it shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened a window of the ark that he had made and sent out the raven, and it went to and from until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent out the dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set its foot, and it returned to him on the ark. For the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took it and brought it into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent out the dove from the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and there in his beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf so no one knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent out the dove, and it did not return to him any more. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the earth, ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Good morning, kids. This morning in church, we hear a story about Noah and the ark. And the story is that um, this man named Noah is told by God to build an ark and that there's going to be a flood and that Noah and all the animals and all the plants are going to be saved, um, even though other people will not be saved through this flood. And I wanted to just talk a little bit about what this means in our lives. What this means in our lives is that when we face hard times, like, I don't know, maybe sometimes it's hard to go to school, or maybe sometimes we get our feelings hurt by people, or maybe sometimes there's an actual storm that's really scary, um, that God wants us to know that we are never alone, that God is always with us and will always, always, always be with us and never abandon us throughout all of the things that hurt us in life and all of the things that are hard in life, that God's love is the one thing that will always remain sure and true. And just like Noah finally landed on dry ground, God will bring us to a new place where we can experience joy and have fun and play and laugh again. So I want you to know, always and forever, that God's love is with you no matter what, even when the lake seems really wavy and you're in the middle of a boat, God is with you. And God's love will never abandon you. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for loving us always, for being with us even when life is hard, and for bringing us to a new and happy place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. give you eyes to see all that is good all that is good the courage for anything may you be strong may you be strong may God give you ears to hear God's loving voice God's loving voice join me in a word of prayer. Oh God, as the wind blows, so your spirit moves in our lives and in your world. As we reflect on your word today, may your spirit, like the wind, move in our lives, helping us to more deeply understand your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to begin this sermon today by telling you a story. It might sound familiar to some of you. It's the story of an angry God and a righteous man. And the story goes like this. There was a God who was angry with the entire human race and decided that this God was going to wipe out the entire human race by way of a flood, destroy them all, except for one righteous man. And he came to this righteous man one day and said, um, I want you to build a boat. And this God, this angry God, told the man exactly how to build the boat, all the dimensions, the cubits, everything. I'm not going to go into that because it's not necessary. But the dimensions were exact, and so the man did exactly what the angry God asked him to do, and he built a boat. It was actually a cube, this boat, strange kind of shape for a boat. Um, the angry God also told the man to bring onto the boat with him, you know, all the different types of animals that lived on earth, the different kinds of seeds, some silver and gold, to bring his family with him. And so the man did exactly what the angry God asked. He also brought a sailor with him, somebody who could help him navigate the storm. And pretty soon, sure enough, the boat was built and the rain started coming. And the earth flooded and day after day and night after night, this man and his crew heroically navigated the sea um, as the waves would come and the wind would blow and the lightning would strike and the thunder would roar. 
day after day and night after night, um, this man saved the boat and all of the animals and people and gold and silver and plants on the boat from the destruction of the earth. Until one day when this boat landed on the top of a mountain that had been swallowed by the sea. The, the boat rested there and the man thought, oh, well, I guess we're going to stop. And pretty soon the rain stopped and the man rejoiced. He was so excited that the rains were done and all the people and animals and everything on the boat had been saved from this torrential flood that had destroyed the face of the earth, everything except for this boat and this man and these people. And so there being no GPS or no compasses back in ancient maritime days, the man did what sailors did and he sent out birds. First he sent out a sparrow and you know if the sparrow didn't come back then that meant that there was dry land and that things were getting better. And so sure enough the sparrow went out but the sparrow came back. There was no dry land no place for the sparrow to make a nest. And so the next thing the man did a few days later, maybe months later, was sent out a dove. The dove also came back indicating nope, no place for that dove to land or live or build a nest. Finally, the man sent out a raven. The man waited several days and the raven did not come back and the man rejoiced again that there was dry land and that the man and his crew could start rebuilding life on earth. The man got out of the boat, offered an animal sacrifice to the gods who received the animal sacrifice and then the gods came to the man and said to him, um, I want to give you two things as a reward for your heroism, for making this boat float all of these days and nights and saving humanity from total destruction. The first thing I'm going to say is I'm going to promise you that this will never happen again. I will never destroy the face of the earth again by flood. And the second thing is that I will grant you the breath of the gods. In other words, you will be immortal and you will live forever. Now, does this story sound familiar to you? Probably most of it does, because it is the famous story of a man named Apnapashtim and the ancient Mesopotamian gods who were angry with the world and destroyed it through flood and granted Apnapashtim eternal life because he was the hero of the story and saved humanity from destruction. And that story is taken from the Epic of Gilgamesh which was written approximately 1,000 years before the Bible was penned. Now, I tricked you, didn't I? Sounds a whole lot like the story of, wait for it, Noah and the Ark. It turns out that 1,000 years before the story of Noah and the Ark showed up in what we now hold today as our Bible, a story that was so similar that you can barely tease out the differences was written in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And a thousand years before that, there was another ancient Near Eastern flood story that was very similar to the ancient Near Eastern flood story in the Epic of Gilgamesh. So why do I begin this way? I think that you know, and I certainly know, that the story of Noah and the Ark is one of the most troubling stories in Scripture. Even though we make it cute and talk about the animals coming in by twosies twosies and rise and shine and give God the glory and all of those things that we teach in Sunday school, it really is a story that makes us question who God is and why God would create and then destroy the earth and only leave one man and all the suffering that must have taken place within the time of that flood and the utter and complete chaos and destruction that people had to live through. It's really hard to wrap our minds around a God who would rain down that kind of destruction on earth. But when we approach the Bible through what we call source criticism, that is looking at the other ancient sources that the Hebrew scripture writers might have been using in order to write what we have today as the Bible, it opens us up to interpret this scripture, especially the story of Noah and the Ark, 
through a different lens. So, it was after the Babylonian exile, which was the time in the life of the Hebrew people where they had been taken captive in Babylon. Their life, their livelihood, everything had been taken away from them. They were living as slaves in Babylon. And it was when they finally had been returned to their homeland and able to rebuild a life that they started writing down scripture. Now the text of the day through which everyone sort of made sense of the world of heroism and of life and death and all of the things that we think about was this epic of Gilgamesh and other stories like it. Myths where people would try and understand how human life works, how creation works, how the gods interact with our lives. Only the Hebrew people had a different take on God because they knew this God of Israel who had set them free from slavery in Egypt, led them into a promised land, taken, they had been taken captive in Babylon and God had been with them the whole time and brought them back so they were able again to resettle in their land. So they were looking at this ancient flood story and saying, how can we reframe this with our understanding of who God is and how God lives and moves in this world and is in relationship with humanity. And so through reframing the story of the Epic of Gilgamesh and other Near Eastern flood stories, the people were able to show us all these years later who the God of Israel is. And they did this through nuanced differences between the other ancient Near Eastern flood stories and the story of Noah and the Ark. So I just wanna highlight a couple of those because in those nuanced differences, we learn the good news of who the God of Israel is. So the first and really significant difference that I noticed is the person who is chosen to um, build the big boat, right? We have this man named Noah. In the Epic of Gilgamesh and other stories, um, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, for example, the man's name is Apna Pashtim, which means man who attains eternal life. So this man is a heroic figure. In the story of Noah and the Ark, Noah is just sort of every man. Um, the name Noah could mean John Doe or Jane Doe. And so like, unlike other names in Hebrew scripture, the name Noah means really nothing significant. It just means person, any person. And so through that nuanced difference, we learn that our God, the God of Israel, the God that we worship through Jesus and the Hebrew scriptures is a God who doesn't choose one righteous person, but who chooses all people, any person, every person to save in this boat when destruction comes to the world. That's good news number one. Another really cool nuance in this story is something that Mark Olson, our friend, actually wrote about um, in his commentary on Noah and the ark. And this difference is um, the word ark. You know how I love the Hebrew language. The word ark is in Hebrew, teva, kind of like the shoe, T-E-V-A, teva. And it's used a couple other significant times in the Hebrew Bible. One time is when um, Moses is put in a basket by his mother and floated down the Nile River. The word for basket is teva. This basket is the thing, the vessel in which Moses is placed and which leads him to life instead of death. Another significant time when this word teva is used is when um, Hagar, who is certain that she's going to die in the desert and has her baby Ishmael with, him, with her, um, sets Ishmael under a bush, and the name for that bush is Teva, um, the bush that is protecting Ishmael from death and leading Ishmael to new life. And so this word becomes so significant in that this is a place um, where we are gently laid in order to be saved from sure and certain destruction. 
And so you see the writers of Hebrew scripture really took this story and, and spun it on its head. Instead of there being a man who is a hero who receives eternal life and who saves the ark from sure destruction, um, there is Noah who simply sits in the ark and lets it float and God is in control. And so this storm rages around him, but Noah is safe in the boat. And that message is consistent with Christian scripture. Not this God of destruction that rains down hellfire on earth and flood and destroys all of creation, but of a God who chooses everyone to save. A God who puts Noah, person, Jane Doe, John Doe, you, me, all of us in the boat and crawls in the boat with us and says, I am here with you. The promise that we have through Jesus Christ is not that um, floods won't come. It's not that lightning won't strike. It's not that the waves won't get big and that, and that suffering won't happen in life. The promise that we have through Jesus is that through it all, God is with us in the boat. I've shared um, stories about my friend Walter before. Walter who suffered from MS and ultimately died from complications of MS. Um, I'll never forget this image and I want to leave, it with you, leave you with it today. Um, there was one day when Walter had fallen on the floor of his van and he had texted a bunch of people to come and help him and um, I got there kind of late to the scene and when I got there I looked in the van to see if he was okay and his wife was just sitting on the floor of the van with him and they were just talking and holding hands. Um, and it was apparent to me that his wife didn't immediately get to the scene and, and pull him up and get him going, but she got there and she sat down and she got on the floor with him and sat there to support him. Not making everything better, but being with him in his humanity. And that to me is the image of who God is in our lives. Jesus Christ, right, chose to come to earth to put on this skin and to get in the boat of life with us. Not to protect us from the storm, but to be with us in the midst of the storm and to ultimately save us. Realizing salvation not for just one, I'm not making us the heroes of the story, like the ancient myths, but God becoming the saving, loving, magnificent hero of every story, the one who loves, the one who saves, the one who gets in the boat with us, and ultimately, in the end, brings us safely to shore. This is the good news we have through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the next time you read the story of Noah and the ark, and I encourage you to open your Bible this week and just read it from, from front to back and know, know there was another source and know that this story is good news about a God who saves, about a God who loves, and about a God who cares for you and me and for all of creation. Amen.
We pray for the church, the world, and all of God's windy creation. God who creates life and promises abundant life. We hear your commitment to relationship rather than destruction, and we pray for the will to match your commitment with our own. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember this day, the terror of 9-11, and the ways our world has changed in the aftermath. We give thanks for those who served and helped, often at great cost to themselves. We grieve for those whose lives were lost, and we grieve with those whose bodies or minds were so injured that their normal was lost, and those whose families were forever altered that day. We recognize the ways our collective grief led to further pain and destruction for others, and the impact the fear and grief of our leaders had on other nations. Even all these years later, we barely know how to pray through the horror of that day and the times that followed. So we pray today to be faithful in following your way, managing consequences that feel outside of our control, and acknowledging we have more power than we realize. We ask for your peace that passes all understanding to fill the earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We look at this world you call the good and we hear it groaning and crying for help. We see the oceans rage and the waters rise, the weather getting more extreme with each passing year. In light of your promise, we pray for relief for your world and for the human community to take responsibility for the changing climate. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The world is not the same as when you first called forth life from the shadows, yet we trust that your spirit still whispers over the waters, your word still recreates, your love still makes all things possible. In gratitude for your creative power and in response to your faithfulness to the world, we ask for your help in living up to your call to care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In this world of constant change, we are grateful for your unchanging love and compassion. Yet we also give you thanks for your flexibility, for your willingness to do a new thing, your insistence on doing anything possible to fulfill your promise of abundant life. We pray new and abundant life over all those we know and love who suffer in any way. We especially lift before you today these beloved of this community of faith. Jerry Casterton, Christopher Ferguson, Rich Groner, Jennifer Harris, John Imes, Dee Levine, Bonnie Lawn, Johan Christofferson's nephew, Ted Mitka, Susie Murray, and Blanca Raniolo's sister, Nellie. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray these and all things in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Thank you, Dana. And we pray peace on your life and in your world today and invite you to share signs of peace as you go about your week until we meet again. We celebrate generosity every week at Nokomis Heights in so many ways with so many generous people in this community of faith. And this week, um, I, I know that many of you received an email a couple weeks ago about a family from Venezuela who we are trying to surround with love and support and care in these days as they just newly arrived here in Minnesota. Um, 
you might not know this, but our entire immigration system is just flooded with, um, with people who have come into our city. And even the resources and the nonprofits that are set up to um, help people are so overcrowded that they have no more capacity to help. And so we are trying to do the one thing that we're called to do, which is respond to the people who are right in front of us. Um, so if you feel called to help this family from Venezuela, Dana has set up an account online. Um, if you go to our online giving um, portal, you can just um, select Venezuelan family and donate money toward them. This money will eventually go, go toward attorney's fees, um, probably toward housing. If you have any leads of people who might have extra space in their homes, um, it's a family of five or maybe have a place to rent, we could definitely benefit from that. Um, you could also just donate a gift card to the church and that would help for some of their grocery expenses and other things. But as we surround this family with um, the people at Nakoma Heights and and a whole community of people in South Minneapolis who are really um, adopting this family and, and wanting and hoping and praying the best for them. Thank you for the generosity that you have already poured out into their lives and for continuing to do so. If you'd like to make just a general gift to Nokomis Heights, we, of course we always appreciate those and we're grateful for all of the generosity that you have bestowed on this church over years and years of ministry to help us um, fulfill God's mission in our world and in our neighborhood. Thank you. Let us pray together. Generous God, you came to us in Jesus who gave his life for the sake of the world. In response, we offer our own gifts, our resources, our time, our imaginations, our love. Use these gifts in your continuing work to make this world whole. We pray this through Jesus who showed us the way of love. Amen. So just a couple of announcements. First of all, Sunday school and confirmation are getting started, so if you know of any kids or teenagers who uh, might benefit from the ministries of Nokomis Heights, uh, please contact the office and let us know. We would love to serve and share God's love with more and more kids as our year goes on. Also, our intern, Pastor Yesenia, has been ill this week, um, finally came down with COVID. The rest of us have all had it, unfortunately, not all of us, but a lot of us, I had COVID just a few weeks ago and Yesenia came down with it. So please pray for her. Um, but also she was supposed to start um, a Bible study and centering prayer and other things on Thursdays. And that has just been delayed a couple of weeks until she really can get her feet under her again. So watch your announcements for when Yesenia will continue that. And finally, I wanna encourage you, um, I still, um, we still, Pastor Steve and, and intern Pastor Yesenia and myself are still leading a Wednesday noon Bible study. And uh, throughout this year, we will be, we study the text for the coming week. So um, if you wanna learn even more about Noah and the ark or about Abraham and Sarah or about some of these stories in scripture, I invite you to join us in that Wednesday noon Bible study. It is on Zoom. And if you need help connecting to Zoom, please just call the church office and we are happy to help you. Those are all my announcements for today. Now receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I'm a big believer in giving credit where credit is due. And um, I want to thank uh, Pastor Shane, Shane Hips, who is the former pastor of Mars Hill Church in Michigan. Um, who retold this story in a way that really resonated with me um, and helped me understand the story of Noah and the Ark in the light of um, the Epic of Gilgamesh. And I also want to thank Mark Olson, who is you know, a friend of our church and has preached here a few times, um, who wrote just a fantastic commentary to kind of help in the preparation for today's sermon. Um, so I just wanted to give credit where credit was due. Thank you to both of um, those fine scholars and preachers who, um, who us sort of normal everyday preachers need to help us um, understand scripture better and um, do a faithful job preaching. That's all. Have a good day.